książkę na temat takiego zjawiska jak i takiego fenomenu, takiego fenomenu jak cultural political economy, kulturowej ekonomii politycznej, której w dużej mierze poświęcony będzie dzisiejszy wykład, a będzie to w dużej mierze opowieść o wspomnianej właśnie kulturowej ekonomii politycznej w kontekście obecnego kryzysu i tego, jakich narzędzi owa metoda dostarcza, jak pozwala nam wyjaśnić wydarzenia, które mają obecnie miejsce i być może znaleźć dla rozmaitych problemów rozwiązania. I po wykładzie spotkanie i dyskusję poprowadzi Pan Profesor Jerzy Dziękuję. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I had a tour of the Institute. I'm very impressed with the range of activities that goes on. I'm very jealous about those of you who are working here and what fun it must be to be involved in a project of this kind. And as a result of being here, a discussion that I had with Professor Hausner and two journalists this morning who've interviewed me, I've rewritten my PowerPoint presentation, which is why we had a little bit of quick uh, technical work that I think addresses much more directly the issues that are of interest here. So I also have corrected the titles of my presentation so it actually coincides with what's been announced, economic imaginaries and economic transformation. Now let me get straight away to the nature of the argument. I'm going to start with a quotation <coughs> from... Ah, we're going to have problems. Um, because the open office software cuts off the bottom of my slides. I wonder whether it's possible to do something about that before I go any further. Um, if we can always use my machine, uh, because that at least I can use Word rather than open office. I will carry on while we're sorting out the technical details because you're familiar with this quotation anyway. It comes from John Maynard Keynes and in the general theory of employment, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little, idea, little else. The ideas that civil servants and politicians and even agitators to supply the current events are not likely to be up to date and current. This is just obviously the general theory written in 1935-36. And now we have 70 years later. It may be that we don't need to. Let me just go down one more. Just about manage if we can't. Um, this is 70 years later. Representative Waxman to Mr. Greenspan. Do you feel your ideology pushed you to make decisions you wish you had not made? Mr. Greenspan, note that he doesn't question the use of the word ideology. He doesn't say, I'm not ideological, don't think me. That is happy to use the word ideology. Remember what an ideology is. A conceptual framework for people to deal with reality. Everyone has one. You have to. To exist, you need an ideology. The question is whether it's accurate or not. I found a flaw, an error in other words. I don't know how significant or permanent it is, but I've been very distressed by that fact. Not as distressed as the people that lost their houses, saw their pensions halve overnight and so forth. But uh, Mr. Greenspan is very distressed by the fact that there is a flaw, an error in his ideology, a flaw in the model that I perceive as the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works, so to speak. Now, I've started without an outline. I just want to put down two markers for thinking about economic imaginaries and economic transformation. A general remark from Keynes about the importance of economic ideas and indeed the enormous lags there can be between the ideas that people use to interpret the world 
and the way in which the world has changed since they learnt these ideas 20, 30, 40 years ago. And then a recognition by Mr. Greenspan that he had an ideology and that there was a flaw in it, that his ideology of how the economy worked didn't in fact correspond to reality. And that I think poses a very interesting question about how we relate the ideas that people have about the economy and the necessary simplifications involved in those understandings of the economy and the way in which the economy actually operates. Now I'll introduce the outline of the paper. I'm going to introduce the idea of culture but interpreted in terms of semiosis, in terms of sense and meaning making. Then I'm going to return to Greenspan and provide a different gloss, a different interpretation of that from the viewpoint of semiosis. But I'm going to be dealing with a number of other issues uh, in this kind. So let's start with the meaning of culture. We're still losing a line or so. I wonder if it's possible for me to use my computer so that uh, we don't... Just, just, just yeah. a second. I'll continue talking while we are trying to point out the technical details. And this, I think, is the challenge that I found when I was asked to be giving a lecture on culture and development in a series. I'm old enough to have been taught economics and anthropology in the 1960s when there were journals called culture and development. But basically, in those era, culture and development was about how underdeveloped economies had a backward culture. And they would only modernize if we could get rid of their backward culture, teach them to think like Talker Parsons or some other American sociologist, and then perhaps they would be able to modernize. So when I was initially asked, will you give a talk in a series on culture and development, my horrible, misspent academic youth came to mind, and I misunderstood entirely what I was being asked to do and therefore said, I can't come and give you a lecture on culture and development, but I can, can come and give you a talk on economic imaginaries and economic transformation. As a result of being here for only a day, I've discovered that culture and development means economic imaginaries and economic transformation it has nothing to do with backwardness, anthropological superiority, and so forth. So let's agree that culture is a polyvalent, polycontextual, concept. I'm not using it in this lecture to mean cultivation, individual societal improvement, modernization, progress in civilization. What I want to do is to focus attention on two possible meanings <coughs> of semiosis, which I understand to be sense and meaning making. Semiosis either as a generic capacity to use language in order to construe order and transform the natural and social world, covering their cultural practices and their embodiment in material culture, or semiosis as a reference to semiotic orders, more or less distinct patterns of cultural practices and material culture. And I think it's interesting in a series of lectures on culture and development to bear both of these meanings of semiosis in mind. Because on the one hand, we have the attempts to construe the world. That is to say, we have the Greenspans of this world with their ideologies arguing that everybody needs an ideology. And then we have particular clusters of sense and meaning associated also with practices. And I think the project that, of which this one lecture is a part around culture and development is taking for granted sense and meaning making, how can we develop distinct patterns of cultural practices and material culture that are transformative, that lead to development and not merely to quantitative growth. So how do we take semiosis seriously? Semiosis, as already said, I understand to be sense and meaning making, is vital to actors' ability to go on in the world. Everyone must reduce complexity by making sense of the world in one way rather than another. And there are a potentially infinite number of ways to make sense of the world. 
It was give meaning to some aspects of this world rather than to others. And as a social scientist, one would analyze or treat semiosis as a key ontological feature of the world, not an optional add-on when you're undertaking your analyses, but something that you must integrate sooner or later into the analysis. So now let me go back to Greenspan. I cut out the interrogative question from Representative Waxman and simply reproduce now the Greenspan reply. I won't read it out again. I just want to headline, everyone needs an ideology. And why does everybody need an ideology? And my starting point is the complexity of the real world. So complex that it cannot be understood in all its complexity in real time. We must reduce that complexity to be able to go on in the world. And therefore, my conclusion is that what Waxman and Greenspan call ideologies are better seen as imaginaries for dealing in a simplified way with the reality at the level of social consciousness. Complexity is not only reduced... Excuse me, uh, if there are some problems with the, uh, with the presentation, we could uh, just um, make the words lower. Okay. This, this be no, it's, it's on the screen here is the problem. It's cutting off occasionally, it's cutting off a line oh, at the bottom. So, uh, and I think it's because I wrote it in Word and it's been open in open office. So oh, well, it's that's the auto formatting. So, so one possibility is just to use my computer, just okay. to switch round, and um, then it will come clean on my computer okay. over here run through. Okay, so we'll make a break for two minutes. Yes. Uh, sorry for just technical problem. Yeah. But anyway, let me continue, because I can talk while the techniques is going on. I'm not that dependent on modern technology that I can't function uh, without it. So what Waxman and Greenspan are calling ideologies are better seen as imaginaries. And the reason I prefer the word imaginary, it contains no pejorative connotations. If you say ideologies, it usually means something along the lines of, I have principles and beliefs they have prejudices, and he has an ideology, or she has an ideology. What I want to convey with the idea of the imaginary is this technical uh, connotation, thank you, of semiosis, that is to say, sense and meaning making. And the argument would be that, as Greenspan says, everybody needs an ideology. You have to live in the world you need an ideology. Oops. We soon will be away. Okay, we're back to where we should be. And you can read every line, which is important for you, but also important for me. Otherwise, I might have forgotten what the bottom line was. And in a modern economy, you should never forget what the bottom line is. <laughs> The real world can't be understood in all its complexity in real time. We have to reduce it. Waxman and Greenspan call those ideologies. I prefer to call them imaginaries because it's less pejorative. Complexity is not only reduced through sense and meaning making, but also through structuration. And I think this is the sense, the logic, both of Keynes's argument and of Greenspan's reply to the question. That is to say, they have ideologies, they have imaginaries, they have understandings of the world. But the question is whether there is a flaw 
in that model of the world. We can only think of a contradiction between the model and the world if there is a world out there with a particular structure. So I'm interested in two ways in which complexity gets reduced, through meaning making, but also through structuration. <clears throat> and one can bring in that as well. So what we mean by social imaginaries, everyone must simply find a real world to go on within it. This involves different entry points, different standpoints. Imaginaries involve the selective observation of the real, natural, and social world. They rely on specific codes, programs, categories to observe it, specific forms of calculation, sensitivity to specific structures of feeling, reference to particular identities that I may have, justification in terms of particular vocabularies of motive, efforts to calculate short or long-term interest. But then there's also structuration, which I understand to be limiting the amount of variation, possible variation in the world. And I could refer to this as restricting com possibility, a term that one takes from philosophy, where the idea of com possibility is that not everything that is possible is com possible. And limiting com possibility is a way of structuring the world. Now I've got a little model here which summarizes uh, what I understand. So we start from the complexity of the real world, too complex to be understood in all its complexity in real time, forcing us to simplify. Everybody needs an ideology. In other words, we need sense and meaning making, but we also need to limit the possibilities that exist out there in the real world in terms of structures. So we have sense of meaning making, structuration, managing the compossible. There are many attempts to make sense of the world, many attempts to structure it. They're all equal at one level, but to paraphrase George Orwell, all attempts at sense and meaning making are equal, but some are more equal than others. All attempts to structure the world are equal, some are more equal than others. Through processes of variation, selection, and retention, certain meanings get sedimented. They get taken for granted. They get naturalized. Nobody questions them. That's the way the world is, and which is the point that John Maynard Keynes was making. The world is ruled by ideas more than it is by vested interests. But people don't even realize the world is ruled by ideas, because these ideas have been so taken for granted, so sedimented, it's just common sense. You don't even realize it's just a particular interpretation of the complexity of the real world, which is governing what you're doing. And the same is true of structures. The world could be different in terms of its structure. But we tend to take for granted the world in which we live. And through variation, selection, and retention over time, we get to sedimented meanings that govern the world and structured complexity which is taken for granted. That, of course, is too simple. Is that all there is? The presentation I've just made, drawing on Keynes, on Greenspan, and some very general sociological theory, might suggest that once men meanings have been sedimented and structuring has occurred, social formations would reproduce themselves in a stable and inertial way. But life isn't that simple, even if the powerful would like it to be, because they benefit, obviously, from sedimented meanings and structured complexity. I want to argue that social order is inherently improbable, because it's improbable that one ever will reach consensus on sense of meaning, and because when we look at the real world, any attempt to make sense of it will be incomplete. My son used to work in the Treasury. The first day that he arrived, they said to him, young Julian, the problem is not to predict where the economy will be in five years' time. The problem is to predict where the economy is now. It's far too complex for us to be able to understand the economy in all its complexity in real time now. So when we're trying to govern the economy, we're not governing the real economy in all its complexity. We're managing or trying to manage our idea of what the economy is. And of course that idea of the economy very often ignores contradictions, antagonisms, what Derrida would call the constitutive outside, the bit 
that's the necessary supplement to what we observe. So I want to present you a different table, the same one at the top, but now showing some of the problems that come from seeing that meaning making is always incomplete and not necessarily consensual, and that structured complexity is usually associated with domination. And then what we have on the lower half of the table is the idea that it's improbable that you would ever reach agreement, improbable that you would ever have a structured complexity which is harmonized all contradictions. And so if we have a pressure of enforced selection from the top, we have a whole series of bottom-up pressures equally anchored in the real world that cause problems for maintaining hegemony, problems for maintaining a particular structure, a particular social formation. You destabilize hegemony by repoliticizing what's been taken for granted, stopping sedimentation, calling into question what has been taken for granted. In other words, you question Greenspan's ideology, the model on which he has been governing or thought the governing the economy on the basis that the efficient market hypothesis, which is the ideology he's talking about, is accurate. Or you critique the ideas of liberalism as Karl Palandy did. And you do that through critique and argumentation by intervening in the particular economic or social imaginaries. And contradictions and crises tendencies produce crisis, and crises are profoundly disorienting. It is precisely the economic crisis that forced Greenspan to see there may be a flaw in the model that he was using in his ideology. So from both sides, from the side of meaning making, everybody needs an ideology, and from the viewpoint of how do you structure an economy, how do you try to make it function well, there are sources of tension which create the possibility continually of calling into question sedimented meanings and discovering that the, the world that we thought was so beautifully structured that we could talk about the great moderation about the fact that we've now solved the problems of the post-war period of growth and so forth actually are simplifications. They ignore something beyond those sets of structures. So that's, if you like, the basic outline of theoretical presuppositions of the next step in the argument, which is to look more closely at economic imaginaries and economic transformation. But the key point then, when I'm talking about economic imaginaries, I am talking about simplifications of what's in the real economy. And when I talk about the structures of the economy, I'm always describing a subset of the full economy. We had an interesting discussion over lunch about how one manages the economy and what besides the formal economy would be necessary to bring in the domestic economy, the social economy, the non-market economy, and so forth. But when people are planning the economy, they very rarely include the informal economy, the domestic labor, the other aspects of the economy. So we need to expand our horizons. I've indicated then that imaginaries can't simply be taken for granted. They are inherently contestable. They're not pre-governmental categories, but creative products of semiotic, that is to say sense and meaning making practices, and the material practices associated with them. They have a central role in the struggle for hearts and minds, but also the exploitation and domination. And this is then the site for struggle as different social forces trying to make one or other imaginary a hegemonic or dominant frame in particular context to promote complementary or opposed imaginary. So Greenspan, he says, everyone needs an ideology. As I said earlier, all ideologies may be equal at one level, but some are more equal than others. It was Greenspan's ideology, his model of how the world worked, so to speak, that became so dominant, it came to frame the economic policies, the social policies, the state policies, the 
economic interventions in terms of foreign economic policy and so forth. The performative power, if you like, the constructive power of Greenspan's ideology was far greater than the performative power of the ideology of a David Harvey or some other critic of contemporary capitalism, the contemporary world order. And so one of the key sites of struggle in contemporary as in previous societies is over which economic imaginary, political imaginary, social imaginary comes to be dominant, comes to hegemonize, comes to frame the attempts to structure the world. These struggles are realized by a symbiosis, but other things as well. So then the question becomes, why are some social imaginaries more hegemonic, more powerful than others? And this particularly matters, for example, in relationship to an economic crisis with its profoundly disorienting effects. One of my favorite theorists, Regis Debray, in his prison writings, describes crises as objectively overdetermined but subjectively indeterminate. They are disorienting. They open up a space of competing reinterpretations, competing construals of what went wrong within the economy. Just to give you two extreme examples in relation to the crisis, which so distressed Greenspan. In the United States, we had one interpretation, one construal, which is the crisis has nothing to do with the subprime mortgages. It has nothing to do with the housing market. The problem that we have in the United States at the moment is that people are not living at peace in God's house. Don't think it's to do with the housing market. It's that we are not living at peace in God's house. And only when we return to the true faith and accept God's commandments will be able to solve the crisis. At the other end, you have the celebration from radical Marxists, this is the terminal crisis of capitalism, somewhere in between a temporary blip. Some of those ideas are so, to use Gramsci's phrase, arbitrary, rationalistic, and willed, they are five minute wonders, and they don't have much resonance, they don't get selected uh, subsequently as a basis for even trying out policies, and even those construals of the crisis that last long enough to be tried out in policy may not work in practice because those imaginaries, those construals, actually don't fit, don't correspond. They're not semiotically and practically adequate to the nature of the problem that's trying to be solved. So we need to see why some social imaginaries get selected and why policies, practices on the basis of those imaginaries which have survived more than the 15 minutes of fame that was promised to us um, by that New York artist whose name I have temporarily forgotten. So he didn't even get 15 minutes of fame. Warhol. In, uh, Warhol. Warhol, that's right, Andy Warhol, thank you. At least somebody has remembered him for more than 15 minutes. So not all policies, not all imaginaries, even if they're selected, get taken up and can be shown to work, to be shown to have real effective material impact and then how they get reinforced, recruited, how it is in the end, as Keynes points out, or as Greenspan points out, that these ideas actually come to rule the world, depends not just on them being ideas, but getting translated into institutions, into practices, into power structures, into networks of action, and so forth. I've got a table here which deals with that. I'm going to circulate the PowerPoint in any case, I'm looking at the time, we've lost a bit of time also with the technicalities. So this is just an attempt uh, which you will be able to see for those of you interested enough to download the PowerPoint when it gets uploaded, uh, how one might deal with variation selection retention. I want to move on now, because I think this is directly to do now with the, the question of culture and development as I now understand it to be interpreted in the context of this um, seminar series. There is a temptation when you're talking about ideology to contrast it with science, which invites the question, is an ideology, as Greenspan refers to it, the efficient market hypothesis, true or untrue? Is it valid 
or invalid. And I think that's an important question to ask about some ideologies. It is not always possible to ask of an ideology, is it true or untrue, if it deals with what linguists call the irrealis, things that aren't real but could be, that to do, for example, with projection into the future. And if I look at the crisis, and I construe it, and I come up with an explanation, one of the other things I'm doing is also saying, how could I solve the crisis? What's the potential in this crisis? How might I take advantage of this crisis to do something different? Some of you may be aware of um, Graham Emanuel, who was Obama's chief of staff in the transition team from Bush W. to Obama. And he was on Bloomberg television saying, you should never let a serious crisis go to waste. And he then gave a list of the things that it was the Obama administration's intention not to let to go to waste in the crisis. In other words, this is not yet a question of true or false, but how can I read this conjuncture? How can I exercise imagination in a rather different way? How can I envisage potential futures that I could realize by exploiting this crisis in order to bring them about? It won't surprise you to know that Rami Emanuel's wish list was neoliberal. Cut back the welfare state, reduce entitlements, lower taxes and so forth, and that's the Obama agenda. But the important thing then is you can assess construals, imaginaries, ideologies in terms of their scientific validity, but you can also assess them in terms of their correctness. What, what is your capacity to read the conjuncture in order to identify potentials that are there which could be realized if you get the strategy right, the alliances right, and so forth. Correctness, then, is not a question of scientific correctness to be tested in a laboratory, in laboratory conditions, but a question of can we make this happen in a conjunction by intervening in order to change it. It's a question of strategic perspectives. So again, taking the crisis that we've lived through, and are still living through, you get initial variation of construals. Some of those will be arbitrary, rationalistic and willed. Others will be correct in the sense that they offer an adequate account, readily communicated, that enables you then to intervene and make things happen that previously were not possible to happen. Because you no longer, you no longer have sedimented meaning, things taken for granted, but ideas, imaginaries have been disoriented because the structure has been shown to be fragile, contradictory, crisis prone. You have a space that opens up for construals. If they are correct, if you can get the balance of forces right and so forth, you can create truth effects, as Foucault refers to them. That's to say, you can make things become true. In fact, really institute the model of the efficient market hypothesis, which is not scientifically true, but if you walk and get enough people to believe in it, you plan policy on behalf of it, you get to make the economy work on that basis. So, let me two further steps, and then I'll reach some conclusions so we can have some general discussion. The project that I heard my Polish is good enough to understand, identify in a flow of Polish words, three English words, cultural, political, economy. What we are working on at the moment is uh, a project to develop cultural, political, economy, which takes semiosis seriously, meaning making, sense making seriously, within the broader critique of political economy. But taking seriously the, end, the idea of sense and meaning making to reduce the complexity of the world pregnant with many possibilities for action or inaction. And the role of semiosis involves both construal, what is the nature of the world, and construction. And I refer you back to the, the instruction given to my son on day one in the Treasury. The problem, young Julian, is not to predict where the economy will be in five years' time, but to know where it is now. When we try to manage the economy, but it could also be 
trying to manage the family, trying to manage regional uneven development, trying to manage the legitimacy of the political system. You're never intervening in the full set of activities, structures, institutions that may be relevant to that. The economy, then, as an object of observation, calculation, management, or governance, never comprises all economic activities. It's an enforced selection of a more or less coherent subset of all economic activities. Which means that whenever you're planning the economy, and it doesn't matter whether it's a command economy or a market economy, you're never able to govern everything that may be relevant to the success of that policy. There is, to use a Derridian trope, a constitutive outside that comes back and undermines even the best laid plans of mice and men to govern the economy, the market economy, the command economy, and so forth. And nonetheless, people act as if their understanding of the economy is the economy, but their ideology is an adequate representation of everything that may be relevant to uh, governing an economy or bringing about transformation. So putting the C, the culture, into political economy is taking semiosis seriously, complexity reduction, economic imaginaries, greenspans, ideologies. But if one's not careful, that simply means that the economy is whatever people construe it to be. You can will any economy into being just by agreeing with everybody else. This is the nature of the economy. There are also, as I said, the constitutive outside, the contradictions that may not be immediately relevant, evident, the dilemmas that are there, the paradoxes that are there, the extra economic conditions, the cycles and so forth, the operations, if you like, of the invisible hand of the market. And in order to do a proper critique of political economy, you need to bring in the ideologies, the economic imaginaries. You also need to bring in your understandings based on careful observation, critique, etc., what the economy is like. Combine the two, and you get cultural political economy. And I can speed up a little bit partly because of repetition, the actually existing economy is the chaotic sum of all economic activities. As such, it can't be an object of economic observation, calculation, management, governance, or guidance. Even if treated as real, even if, in other words, you really believe your economic ideology, if you really do believe that the ideas that you inherited from some dead economist or political theorist are accurate descriptions of the real world, you're continually going to discover that, in fact, they don't correspond to the full complexity of the economy, the political system, the complexities of the contemporary family system, or whatever. <coughs> so, whilst simplifying everybody needs an ideology may help you to go on in the world, you're continually going to come up against the fact that there are limits to the way in which you can go on in the world. So. What do we mean by economic imaginaries in a bit more detail? All attempts to construe, all efforts at meaning making that appropriate and transform nature for material provisioning. So economic imaginary, in my language, is a term of art. It can include technological paradigms, production norms, labor process, forms of economic organism, all the various ways in which from different levels, from different perspectives, different standpoints, we try to understand the nature of the Economy. And that always is the product of a contested social imaginary, which would be more or less hegemonic. Uh, some of you familiar with Gramsci will recognize already that I've been using the phrase arbitrary rationalistic and willed rather a lot, which isn't itself arbitrary rationalistic and willed. It's a very good term to apply to the difference between random interpretations. The reason why we have an economic crisis in the United States is that we're not living at peace in God's house. And those that are more organic and that can provide the basis for understanding where the crisis came from and how to put it right. Durable economic imaginaries then will always have a central, albeit always partial correspondence to actually existing or potentially realizable material interdependencies in the economy and the outside world. And this 
where economic imaginarism, economic transformation becomes incredibly important. Because if we want to bring about an economic transformation, if we want to bring about a challenge to the dominance of a purely market-mediated, profit-oriented form of economic organization, you have not only to understand the way the world is economically, but to come up with correct interpretations of the irreal, what might be, what potentials exist. So I'm not suggesting, for example, we should all gather together and bring about a resurrection of feudalism. I don't believe in the current crisis of return to feudalism is possible. That would be an arbitrary rationalistic and will construal. But one could move on to a rebalancing of the market economy, the social economy, the informal economy to think about the natural economy as also having relevance as well, and then use those alternative construals, those alternative readings of what's here in potentia, which could be realized, but aren't yet true. In other words, trying to develop correct construals. One of the journalists who interviewed me this morning summed it all up and said, ah, I see what you're saying. The question is, in the current crisis, do we want to rescue the banks or do we want fresh air? In other words, are we trying to interpret the crisis in terms of how can we get as quickly as possible back to financial business as usual? Or how do we use the crisis, don't let a serious <coughs> crisis go to waste, to put an entirely different and alternative economic agenda on the table? Not that it already exists, but it may be there in potentia. So it's a question not of the scientific truth of your interpretation, but whether or not it is politically powerful, resonant, and so can it become organic. So now, I've been talking about culture and different ways to read it. Now, a couple of slides, and I shall stop, uh, on economic development or economic transformation. In discussions I had with Professor Hausner in the past, We've sometimes talked about the difference between growth and development. So economic growth is merely more of the same. Bigger GDP, higher wages, more consumer goods and so forth. And economic development, which is transformative. And what I want to suggest, building on that distinction, is that when we're talking about culture and economic development, we're probably talking about culture, specific new sets of practices organized in terms of an economic imaginary but also translated into effective <coughs> practices about culture as cultural innovation, not merely economic in a narrow sense but a much broader understanding of the full potential of economics and economic transformation. So not growth and more growth and even more growth but identifying the basic social forms that exist at the moment and treating those as a, so a focal point of change, a focal point of intervention. In the current situation, what that means is then trying to decipher what the basic forms of a capitalist system are and how they might be transformed. How can we challenge the dominance of the commodity form as governing the economy? How can we uh, challenge the dominance of the money form governing social relations. Money form also as capital form. Money is only worth having if money creates money, rather than money being used to mediate, to smooth the path for the realization of objectives that are not purely accumulation, accumulation, accumulation. That is Moses and the prophets. So one can continue unfolding other of the forms that are characteristic of capitalism that need to be challenged. And then this is a quick account I want to move on to transformation and then think a little bit about what transformation means. Uh, one of the things I'm involved in at the moment is at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Berlin, which those of you that know it know is associated with the left party in Germany, which is a really heterogeneous ragbag of the party. But one of the projects there is transformation. And it's really the reliving of the past of the East Germans who failed to transform state socialism 
into something meaningful as an alternative to capitalism. It's an attempt to rethink what went wrong in the transition after socialism. And they're coming up with a number of interesting distinctions. That if we look at the social forms, the institutional forms, the organizational forms, forms of life, we can think about reform, which is simply improving the ways in which the current system operates to improve its operation within the existing system. Attempts to rebalance different forms to improve their overall functioning. A little bit less market, a little bit more state, a little bit more less state, a little bit more network governance and so forth. Counter-reform, which doesn't mean counter-reformation, but starting to intervene the relationship between different forms to prepare the ground for long-term transformation and then transformation. And this is my concluding statement. There are a lot more slides, but so we started late. We had technical problems. We've been very patient. We're getting up to 7 o'clock. It's time to have some discussion. So what I think we can say is that I've emphasized that a key part of thinking about how the economy is organized, how economic policy is organized, depends upon recovering and critiquing the dominant ideas. The, as, I, as Cain said, we are ruled by ideas, not by vested interests. I think that's a one-sided statement. We're also ruled by vested interests. But those vested interests rule in terms of their everybody needs an ideology, the efficient market hypothesis. We will not understand the economy without also understanding the economic imaginaries, the sense and meaning making involved in organizing the way in which people go on in the economic <coughs> world. But nor will we understand it if we only look at economic imaginaries, start charging people with being ideologically biased and so forth. The, the other challenge is not to change people's economic imaginaries, it's also to bring about transformation. And I've done less on this, there's more in the slides we can discuss it, but what that means is thinking about how the economic possibilities are constrained on the side of structuration. How opportunities are closed down through the fixing of different relationships between different social forms. So they come to acquire a coherence, what I called in one of my slides a structured complexity. What David Harvey refers to as structured coherence, which seems to work well until it doesn't. But all the time it's working well, nobody ever thinks that the world could be different. Nobody ever wonders whether an alternative world is possible. But for an alternative world to be possible, one not only needs an alternative economic imaginary, which strictly speaking shouldn't just be an economic imaginary, but also a political imaginary, an imaginary for an alternative way of organizing society and so forth. But that needs to be tied with a series of proposals about reform calibration, re-articulating current forms to prepare the ground for long-term transformation, and then also thinking about transformation itself. There's a less coherent set of conclusions than I wanted to reach, but then we've got some debate, and perhaps the, the conclusions will be fine-tuned as a result of the discussion. And I can say, oh yes, I'm glad you asked that question, because I've got another 38 slides waiting to be presented, and I can choose one that answers the point exactly. So I'll stop there and we can move to discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. And now the floor is open for your comments. And there are also questions. The comments are preferable form. So please, who would like to start? You're welcome. May I? <coughs> You have been very carefully avoiding any reference to the word, or you had better to say concept, which comes to mind instantly when we think about the uh, ideology of culture. Mm. I mean values. Mm. Uh, so, my question is why? Uh, you even did not include uh, values in your definition of ideology. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of uh, imaginary or 
imaginarization, is it a good word? Okay. We'll agree to use it for the moment. Uh, uh, right, okay. Uh, uh, how much do you believe that values are important in this process? And uh, uh, the next question, what about uh, transformation in your meaning? It's probably even more relevant in this respect. So this is one question. The second is of quite different, not theoretical nature. It's about your own imaginary. Uh, do you uh, really believe that uh, looking, at, looking at the modern time politics, do you really believe that our world is uh, uh, ruled more by ideology than by vested interest? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really see very much of uh, ideological or theoretical discussion uh, mm -hmm. in contemporary politics. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of uh, vested interest. So this is quite a different question. Okay, all the questions. Have you wanted to deal with them? Answer yes, them please. As we go along. We are responsible. Okay, uh, I've just called up my definition of social imaginaries in the round. So it's not only cognitive complexity reduction, um, relying on specific codes and programs, categories, it moves on to structures of feeling. Structures of feeling are already, in some sense, normative, effective value laden, reference to particular identities, which will also then bring in the question of values, because my identity is not a purely uh, reductive material identity, but if I see myself as a socialist, or I see myself as religion being an important part of my identity, values will come in in that way. The justification in terms of vocabularies of motives Vocabularies of motive always refer in part to values, norms, and so forth. And efforts to calculate one's short to long term interests are not necessarily material. There are, after all, ideal interests, and Max Weber emphasized those a great deal. But uh, my interest in salvation, even if we don't agree there is a heaven, if enough people believe there is a heaven and therefore organize their lives in terms of their ideal interests, how would I get to heaven? How would I bring about justice? Values would come in there as well. So perhaps by starting with Keynes and starting by Greenspan, I gave the idea that these were purely cognitive maps that were involved. But one of the ways to reduce complexity is to look at things from not only an entry point, but I use also the phrase standpoint. So I might look at the world from the viewpoint of how it's organized economically, but I might also take the standpoint within that viewpoint of either being a bourgeois or an old-time aristocrat or a proletarian. So an economic entry point can be associated with different valued standpoints, and that would also be an important part the analysis. So I think values come in, but you're right, I didn't use the word value and highlight that in terms of what I said. It's completely, I think, integratable, even if I didn't integrate it into what I'm doing. I want now to move on to the question of imaginary and my own imaginary and whether I really believe, as my opening quotation suggested, that the world is ruled by ideas rather than vested interests. Of course I don't. One of the reasons I don't believe that is that I have two pillars for looking at how complexity gets reduced. One of them is semiosis, sense and meaning making. If that was the only way in which complexity was reduced, the world would be ruled by ideas and little else. But the complexity is also reduced through structuration by setting limits to compossible social relations. And if you remember my table, let's see whether we go down, yes. So I have hegemony on one side and domination on the other. Your vested interests are embedded in the patterns of domination. And what is of interest is the relationship between hegemony in Gramsci's terms as political, intellectual, and moral leadership. So even Gramsci 
in relation to your question on values, brings in the moral dimension as an important part of hegemony. Without values, limited hegemony, because it looks then just to be talking your own book, just crude materialism, crass materialism. You need a moral dimension. You need a value dimension for hegemony. But that's not all there is to the ordering of the world. There's also the patterns of domination. And there, that's equally important in terms of my imaginary. Um, I usually, at this point, and why, why, why break with tradition, refer to a definition of power that comes from Karl Deutsch. Power is the ability not to have to learn from your mistakes. And that's exactly where vested interests come in. So we have a crisis, it's disorienting, but the vested interests don't say, oh, I found a flaw in my model of how the economy works, the efficient market hypothesis. I'm going to start reading Marx's Das Kapital, and tomorrow I'm going to start using the Federal Reserve to bring about a radical socialist transformation. What they do is to try to find another justification for their model of how the world works in order you can return to financial business as usual. So I have a place for values on the meaning dimension, particularly when we bring in hegemony in Gramsci's sense as political, intellectual, moral leadership, and I have a place for vested interests. The moment one moves not just from this system is structured, but it's structured in order to produce and to reproduce patterns of domination. And even the subordinate classes, subordinate classes or subordinate groups have their interests uh, in either reproducing the system or not. The current crisis has led a lot of people to say, oh, please restore the economy to growth. We want jobs. We want to be able to repay our mortgage. So even subordinate groups have their vested interests. And finally, in terms of ideology, I think there is a confusion now of what we mean by ideology. It's no part of my argument there is an end of ideology. As Daniel Bell or Fukuyama or other people put it, uh, and I certainly would never claim that there can be an end to imaginaries. I actually think, and it should be clear already from what I said, that we still live in an age where struggles for hegemony are occurring and where vested interests are trying to shape those hegemonic imaginaries, and by managing the crisis to reproduce the patterns of domination that serve their vested interests. That's done in less ideologically open ways than previously, partly because of the sedimentation of neoliberal discourse. Part of any approach of a critical cultural political economy would be precisely to critique the ideology, ideology critique on this side, and to critique the domination of their shunt on the same. A long answer to a short question, but at least it gives other people now a chance to see what one might be able to do with some of these rather abstract schemas. Yes, who is the next? Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the dimension of the Keynes and uh, uh, some months ago it was a uh, discussion about uh, Keynes versus Hyde in the test. And, um, oh, the debate at the LSE, the virtual debate at the LSE. Uh, perhaps you don't know about that, but yes, there's a lot of debate going on, Hyatt versus Keynes, or Keynes versus Hyatt. Yeah, yeah and uh, uh, most of the, uh, there was a couple of college economists uh, from the universities, and most of them, uh, they were uh, for like, Hayek, yeah. Um, and so, what is your opinion in that case, because uh, in the case of complexity and uh, that we are trying to manage uh, the economy for the next five years and we can't manage it uh, for today. Uh, uh, what, what is your opinion? Uh, how do you see this? Uh, uh right, I would say that Keynes and Hayek are both wrong but for different reasons. They're both wrong but for different reasons because neither of them get to grips with the true character of the contemporary economy, which isn't just a market economy. Uh, in which money is a useful means of lubricating economic activities. Money is not only money, but it's also capital. And when you look at money, 
also as capital. When you look at money, not merely as a national money that is governed by national governments with their budgets in order to bring about full employment, or saying we shouldn't be creating more money that only produces inflation, let the market decide. What they're doing is already taking for granted the structured complexity that comes from a capitalist social formation and the economic imaginaries that have bound up with that. I would see the debate between Keynes and Hayek as occurring within the categories of a capitalist economy and not challenging those categories. And as I said, I've got lots of slides and you've just given me the opportunity to put one more up. And that's how I would locate the debate between Keynes and Hayek. So I'm referring to the first volume, the first book of Capital, Capital Volume 1, first chapter. Why is it that wealth in capitalist societies takes the form of an immense accumulation of commodities? And if you want, don't understand that the capitalist economy is one that is premised on the organization of the economy as a commodity producing, commodity consuming society, we've already got problems. The commodity form is then generalized to labor power, but it isn't really a commodity. You don't need to be a Marxist to say that. It would be Karl Polanyi's Christian socialist to say that we should not treat land, money, labor power, or I would add knowledge as a commodity. They're not. They are natural resources that shouldn't be reduced to the status of a commodity. We can go on. Money as a social relation mediating profit-oriented market mediated accumulation. This is not something that Keynes debating with Hayek would want to start with, nor would it be a starting point for Hayek. It would simply want to look at money as the lubricant of economic exchange and then look to see what happens if people save too much money or don't sit or spend too much money and how you get that balance right. So I would say that in relation to Keynes and Hayek, if one has to side with the devil or the deep blue sea, I will side with Keynes over Hayek because I think at least he has a lot of critical intuitions about the crisis prone nature of the capitalist economy, the extent to which it doesn't automatically or even with a little bit of help from the state of getting the auto-liberal framework right, automatically produce uh, equilibrium. So to the extent one had to take sides, I would take sides with Keynes over Hayek. But I would want actually to say that um, neither of them really grasps the full complexity of the contemporary capitalist economy. But also, just drawing on this again, if you take a fuller understanding of what a capitalist economy is like, it provides you with a much better framework about thinking of alternatives. So I'm sure that if we asked him, Professor Hausner would be able to begin to give a, an account of what the social economy would look like by saying, well, wealth would not take the form of accumulation of commodities. There could also be other ways in which wealth would be created in terms of creativity, in terms of inventiveness, in terms of free time and so forth. But I'm not going to put words in his mouth and speak for himself. But at least if we have a clear reference point, we can begin to think of alternatives. We can also begin to think, well, we're not going to abolish capitalism overnight, but there are different types of capitalism. So let's try to look at forms of organizing and reorganizing capitalism that might lead to greater transformative potential, rather than entrenching and doubling up on a belief in the efficient market hypothesis and therefore the route to recovery from the current economic and financial crisis is more free trade agreements, more emancipation of market forces, fewer entitlements, fewer protections, cutting back the social wage and so forth. So it also gives you a grid for thinking about alternatives within capitalism as well as a grid for locating different positions in contemporary economic policy debate. Yes, please. <clears throat> uh, I would like to say that I uh, really like your way of thinking, but one thing I'm not understanding is why do you really need the notion of complexity? Uh, to me, the, the notion of complexity is quite arbitrary one, which we can use as a tool of 
symbolic violence. You can always <laughs> accuse someone that his thinking is uh, much more simplistic than yours. Mm. You often hear the argument that African or communist countries had simple, uh, very simplistic social systems or cultural systems, while the uh, core countries of the world systems have very complex societies, which is for me always you know, easy to prove wrong, but uh, that's in no sense that it's just what I believe that simply there is no objective measure of complexity. Maybe you've heard of the complex systems uh, theory, which argues actually that the, 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 the complexity is a product of few very simple mechanisms, yes. which, 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 which I think it's difficult to uh, really objectively assess. But, but then uh, I don't uh, understand this notion of this, which you seem to here present of the this real existing complex world and this very simplistic uh, meaning and economic uh, system. Okay. Uh, this is a very good question. I've never been asked it before. And I'm going to be more careful in future that I don't commit symbolic violence or create the space for symbolic violence. It's a very good point, but actually that's not what I'm trying to do. The, the way in which complexity is taken seriously. I have a colleague, John Ari, that's written a book on complexity and social theory. He believes that you can model complexity. My view is that the world is so complex, any complexity science is some one way to reduce complexity. But modeling complexity already reduces complexity in order to fit it into a model. So when I talk about complexity, I don't want to describe societies in terms of whether they're more complex or less complex. I just mean that the world is so complex that we can't grasp its complexity in real time. That makes it almost irrelevant whether or not socialist planned economies were more simple than modern market societies and so forth. My starting point is a different one. If the world is complex, and I use that really as an empty signifier, just as a starting point to get me going, the interesting question is not how can I theorize complexity, how can I model complexity, whether my model of complexity is better than your model of complexity. But we all are forced to reduce complexity. That is to say, that gives a crucial status for our reflections on the nature of any society, even a primitive.